talk. Today's talk topic is the coloniality of queer theory, the effects of homo normality, norm, normativity on tran transnational Taiwan's path to uh, equality. We're delighted to welcome Professor uh, Gaoying Tao, um, who's a, an assistant professor of sociology at Virginia Commonwealth uh, University. The topic um, uh, of today's talk is one that has proved very, very popular among our students over the last uh, decade. We've seen growing student interest in terms of their essays um, and dissertations on gender, and particularly LGBT related um, uh, topics. And this has actually led us to change uh, our teaching at SOAS. So we give more focus to gender issues in, uh, in Taiwan. And because of that student interest, over the last decade, we've had numerous um, uh, talks that address um, LGBT related um, issues. The majority of our talks have come at this topic from the angle of social movement uh, studies. Uh, we've also had talks that look at this issue from a more legal uh, perspective. And we've also hosted uh, many practitioners, so social movement activists, many of whom um, Professor Gull actually interviewed uh, uh, in the process of his research for um, uh, today's talk, which has been uh, published in Sexualities. Um, but I think the angle that Professor Gull takes um, uh, in terms of looking at this is issue from a kind of queer theory um, perspective is really different. And I think that's one of the reasons why I was really delighted that uh, you're willing to come uh, and join us and, um, and bring a different perspective. And I think one of the things was quite interesting. I was kind of thinking back to the talks we've had over the last decade. And perhaps the first one that actually addressed queer issues in Taiwan was actually 10 years ago by He Chun Rei. Um, and of course, that's some, one of the people that you actually do kind of engage with um, in today's uh, talk. And Professor Gao is going to speak for uh, about 40, 45 minutes, and then uh, we look forward to um, um, a similar amount of time for, uh, for Q&A. So um, um, let me now hand over to Professor Gao. Thanks for, for being willing to share the, um, your research and your, your time with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Phil, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you so much, Solis, um, Dr. Zhang, and Hao Yu, and everyone who uh, make this event possible. Um, as I said you know, before the event to uh, Dr. Phil, I'm so delighted to be able to uh, be granted this opportunity to talk with you all at, uh, in London or around the UK uh, or maybe around the country because you now we are living in the virtual world already. Uh, because you know, in 2017, uh, I had a chance to join uh, another SOAS conference you know, focusing on the queer Asia's studies by, by using the decolonial um, and um, transnational perspectives. And that also uh, fundamentally inspired my research that I proposed in this uh, in this journal article. Um, so as Dr. Fell said, you no, know, um, my research uh, path is very different from um, some uh, previous scholars that you may have to hear to you know when Taiwan is approaching to uh, the legalization of sex marriage, um, people tend to use more um, social policies or LGBT rights perspectives you know, to argue why Taiwan deserves to be the first Asian country to legalize sex marriage. Um, but this uh, study takes a very different perspective in the way that I examined you know, how the globalization plus localization that I call the lo localization uh, of some radical queer theories has been influenced um, Taiwan's uh, LGBT rights. So here we go. Um, just let people know that um, this article is part of my larger project um, of a book that I'm currently writing on, you know, which is about the transnational network of anti-LGBTQ uh, conservative movements. So when people ask me if uh, Dr. Gao, you are studying um, Taiwanese queer studies, uh, I usually say back to them that no, I'm studying Taiwanese anti-queer studies. And I use um, the... Um, my queer body, you know, to delve myself into the anti-LGBTQ um, movement, uh, 
movement parts and to try to understand you know, how the conservatives may influence you know, Taiwan's future. So this article is a side project from my larger book project. Taiwan was the first Asian country to legalize its marriage in 2019. After over three decades of queer activism and a decade long anti-LGBTQ battles, many traits of the Taiwanese uh, marriage equality campaigns seem similar to their American counterparts with ubiquitous rainbow uh, flags and love discourses. The similarities has uh, tempted many queer critics to apply the queer homonormativity critics to deconstruct Taiwanese queer activism. So in this paper, I rethink the queer desire of globalizing the homonormativity critics to queer Asia and critically examine the colonial effects of the globalization of homonormativity in the global south. Following Maria Lugones' critique toward the coloniality of gender, this research interrogates the coloniality of queer theory and asks, how does queer theory produce colonial effects on queer politics in Taiwan? I focus on Lisa Dugan's homonormativity critique that she produced in this book, The Twilight of Equality. And I use Lisa Dugan's homonormativity critics to examine the transnational trajectory and consequence. Homonormativity as idea aims at deconstructing three pillars of the perceived American queer activism. First one, the privatization of public problems. Second, the assimilation of middle class hetero patriarchy. And third, the expansion of neoliberal uh, corporatization in queer activism. So Lisa Dugan proclaimed in her book, welcome to the new world. Because you know, um, to some uh, minds that may not be familiar with Lisa Dugan's argument, you no, know, she used the uh, American queer activism as the case studies you know, to argue, actually, you know, the fight for marriage equality in the US context has been privatizing many public problems like the healthcare, uh, like the incarceration capitalism into the private domain. And she also argued, you no, know, marriage equality is a way to assimilate um, the sexual and the um, gender minority people, like LGBTQ people into the middle class heteronormative patriarchal family style. And she also argued that the American queer activism you now becomes one of the conspiracy you know, of the American neoliberal capitalism. Um, but I use these three pillars to think through um, the Taiwan's path to census marriage. Um, does Lisa Dugan's New World Clan include Taiwan and Asia? Now here I use Asia in the plural form following the Queer Asia's uh, initiative to argue that um, Asia actually is a plural and a highly diverse and heterogeneous area. I also argue and asked what happens you know, when homonormativity critics are not only elite discourses and themselves become pivotal players in Taiwanese Asian politics of sexual citizenship. Queer Asia studies provide triple challenge to the coloniality of queer theory. First, they reveal how queer theory has been complicit in the global asymmetry of citational politics and colluded with American nationalism and geopolitics. Second, queer theory helps perpetuate Northern theoretical hegemony, as uh, Ray Winkono argued, and queer theory oppresses que uh, Asian queer scholarship as only case studies when the uh, North American queer thinkers use American cases to theorize uh, the, uh, the legitimacy of their own uh, hegemonic knowledge. And third, Queer Asia studies expose the disciplinary exclusion that traumatizes many queer Asia scholars. Thus, Matthew Wade's no, um, argue in the introduction of this book, Queer Asia, demands the decolonization of queer knowledge by carefully discussing the meanings and limitations of queer concepts while conceptualize and contextualize the variations in 
political strategies, human rights, and queer politics. So building on the queer Asia studies, I interrogate what colonial effects has homonormativity produced in Taiwan? How can we decolonize queer Asia studies and decolonize queer theory in general? Um, so in this research, no, I, um, I said this article is part of my larger book project, right? So in the, my larger project, no, I first interview English and Chinese speaking um, people. I also review the English and Chinese language publications that articulated homonormativity with um, Taiwanese sexual politics, including uh, Josephine Hall's article that Dr. Fell just mentioned, and also many of her followers, including Hans Huang and Patrice Liu, um, and uh, among others. So these texts uh, in my research were interrogated against my first-hand ethnographic data that I collected in Taiwan's anti-LGBTQ uh, campaign, anti-marriage equality campaign for uh, 22 months, along with uh, my interviews with 97 respondents uh, whose political stance ranging from extreme conservatism to queer radicalism, which means it's a super wide political spectrum from the far left to the far right. And I will be very glad to answer more questions about my methodology in the Q&A section. Uh, and just like people know, actually the numbers that I presented in this article has been uh, increasing because I just finished another round of the field work in Taiwan just uh, at the end of last, uh, last year. So um, the project is moving, right? And um, before I give you my research findings, no, I want to show my uh, feminist self reflexive and re reflexivity of my positionality as a researcher, uh, as a Taiwanese study researcher as, um, who had a multiple hats. I entered the field and also this, um, this area uh, with multiple identities. I was born into a working class, uh, cisgen uh, working class family, and, and I've been a cisgender gay queer for um, more than two decades. Um, I hopefully I did not look that old. Uh, but you know my age. Um, I've been trained as a sociologist, you know, using the sociological theories and the methodologies. Uh, I've been an openly gay and um, a prominent nationally uh, Tongzhi LGBTQ activist you know, since my college life. So that was also roughly two decades ago. Um, I was serving as the gender equity educator um, in the Ministry of Education um, to help them to publicize you know, the gender equity at curricula you know, at the national and the county city levels and to educate uh, uh, our seed uh, teachers you know, to develop the curricula of gender equity education and uh, develop their own pedagogical skills you know, to teach all the teachers within their own cities and the counties. Um, I served that position for 2.5 years before I migrated myself to uh, Rogers, New Jersey in, uh, in the US you know, to pursue my PhD. I have um, also uh, converted to be a Presbyterian Christian. Um, so if you hear some uh, critical uh, analysis about Christianity or Christian conservatism in the research, um, that is uh, part of um, the criticism coming from within um, the community, not um, um, not found without. Uh, as a Taiwanese studies uh, scholars, you know, I'm also a transnational world traveler you know, who has been raised in uh, East Asia, but con uh, consistently and continuously thinking across all the national borders. So um, whenever I talk about my research, you know, uh, my six hats always influenced interchangeably and interactively to shape my own thinking. So please um, help me to put them in mind. OK, here we go. What I found, um, first of all, I found this uh, uh, preemptive deployment of homonormativity critics uh, in the field. Homonormativity as a queer critics um, in Taiwan spread from a vocal group self-branded as family marriage abolitionist Hui Jia Fei Hun Pai. And thanks to um, their own cultural translation, homonormativity critics in Taiwan were not reactionary. 
they were preemptive deployment that preceded Taiwan's national marriage equality campaigns. One of my queer activist interviewee, Ashley Wu, Wu Xu Liang, who has been passed away um, from us, reflected that, quote, most intellectual theories used in Taiwanese queer activism come from the US. The preemptive deployment engendered queer theory to be swiftly appropriated by moral conservatives to demonize and demoralize marriage equality and same-sex marriage. Both queer radicals and religious conservatives unintentionally worked together to delay the marriage equality legislation. My research found that homonormativity globalization in Taiwan has produced four colonial effects. For the time's sake, um, uh, I want to talk briefly about each of them um, and welcome more questions about the details you know, during the Q&A section. So first of all, um, I found the globalization of um, homonormativity has been producing the colonial the disrupt between queer theory and queer practices. The preemptive common normativity critiques deconstructed indigenous identities and self-made norms even before their four constructions. My indigenous interviewee, Hana, who is a uh, Talugu, the Trugu tribe, no, uh, Tailu Gezu, and, um, um, and another anonymous lesbian couple, who both are Amis, uh, Amezu, felt pr pressured by preemptive clearing. Indigenous queers in Taiwan faced twofold struggle. Resisting inter ethnic inequalities, they, in, they joined the indigenous rights move, movement to battle for decolonizing intersectional Japanese and Han Chinese oppressions pursuing identity reconstruction and reviving cultural traditions. Resisting heteral patriarchy, at the other hand, they endeavored to earn recognition of their own queer desires and identities within indigenous kingships and families, while the tribal leaders continue to hold authority over interpreting the tradition in a more uh, heteronormative and patriarchal ways. So here, queer anti-identitarianism and homonormativity intervene with double coloniality. They dismantled the already vulnerable Taiwanese indigenous identities before construction and destroyed indigenous queers' burgeoning gender sexual subjectivities prematurely with overwhelming deconstructive power. The double coloniality that oppressed Taiwanese indigenous queers echoes the queer Palestinian critic of the Western empire of critic. And queer investment in the ongoing settler colonialism and the tension between anti-coloniality and anti-patriarchy in the US indigenous queer studies. So that's the first one. The second effect I found is the universalism of queer theory. The three pillars of homonormativity critics are challenged in Taiwan. First, regarding the privatization of public problems, actually Taiwan's queer activism began with a social infrastructure drastically different from American society. As the table one in my article shows, Taiwanese, um, Taiwanese citizenships um, had enjoyed the national health care since the 1990s, and over 99% of Taiwanese residents uh, had been covered by affordable health care in 2017, which is very different from the American context. So compared to the US, Taiwanese society has a lower economic inequality in terms of the Gini index here, far less military expenditure, and a higher employment rate. This contrasts with American queers' concerns of healthcare reform, military expansion, immigration policies, and incarceration capitalism before e equality. Then second, 
does marriage equality always come with the cost of heteronormative assimilation? Taiwan hosts counter examples. Taiwanese campaigns initiated three pillars simultaneously, including marriage equality, the pansexual partnership system, uh, and polyamorous multi-person household. The three pillar package aimed at legally protect and recognize various family types and challenge heteropatriarchy, homonormativity, and monosexism at the same time. However, these revolutionary queer attempts in Taiwan were marriage washed away by many international news, including BBC, CNN, and other mainstream media's orientalist gaze. Um, so those medias not tend to give uh, uh, international people only the rainbow flags, only the love uh, of the kisses of census couples, um, among with other romantic image. But they tend not to report many uh, progressive and uh, revolutionary career attempts and in initiations that Taiwan has been providing to the world. Does marriage equality always benefit the white and middle class gay men, as uh, homonormativity critics suggests. Taiwan's campaign have been led by women, actually, and achieved for women. Women are the campaign faces and voices. The, cons uh, the uh, consequences are also gendered. In the first year of the legalization of sex marriage in Taiwan, um, over 2,000 lesbian couples registered to marry at a gender ratio that is over 2.1 times the gay men couples in Taiwan. Taiwan's gender ratio 2.1 is also significantly higher than its American counterpart at 1.17 in favor of queer women. Thus, marriage equality in Taiwan enables underprivileged women to put resources together emancipate from the heteropatriarchal family control and create the unchosen family with legal recognition. Thus, homonormativity assimilation assumption is falsified by the Taiwanese case. Thirdly, neoliberal capitalism is not universal. Outside queer activism, Taiwan's economy is composed of small to medium-sized family-owned enterprises that account for 97% of all companies in Taiwan. Taiwan's businessmen objected same-sex marriage because it would open the door to strangers with different family names who would step into their own family-owned enterprises and threaten their own patriarchal privilege and power. Thus, marriage equality steps the heart of Taiwan's uh, capitalism at the microeconomic level. Inside queer activism, Taiwan's queer organizations tended to be anti-capitalist. While the American population is 14 times that of Taiwan, the annual revenue of the largest American poor equality organization like HRC, Human Rights uh, Council or campaign, is 56 times greater than that of its Taiwanese counterpart. This disproportionate gap exists because Taiwanese- It's one o'clock. Sorry, that's my clock of my AMAC. This disproportionate uh, gap exists because Taiwanese uh, queer adolescents do not depend on big donors, but mainly built on grassroots micro donations, self-exploited workers with humble salaries and thousands of volunteers that work for uh, queer activism for free. This budget model enables Taiwanese queer activism to focus on serving communities and escape from neoliberalist intervention. Thus, it is not true and not fair to impose Lisa Dugan's Equality Inc. framework to Taiwanese queer activisms. They are closer to what I would call 
equality in the a, a model of grassroots groups who have collaborated with civil society and the government to challenge heteropatriarchy in both public and private domains. Abundant Taiwanese evidence falsifies the universality of homonormativity and American queer theory and proves that the uh, communitarian queer activism can succeed without replicating the U.S. model. The third colonial effect I found in my field is the radical queer temporality. The false universalization of homonormativity relies on a deeper structure of time that I call radical queer temporality. Radical queer temporality is a temporal hierarchy based on queer radicals American time. A linear imaginary of modern sexuality and futuristic developmentalism, while against equality, which is a book, the against uh, equality authors felt tired of, quote, the old rhetoric from the marriage, the gay marriage movement, unquote. May I ask, gay marriage is old to whom? While American queers claim that we are living in the era after marriage equality, which is a, a series of another three books, who are we in these claims? Who has privilege to live in an after era? Radical queer temporality apparently blocked over 87% of the UN countries outside their own after marriage equality club and ignore global LGBTQ people's sufferings of criminalization, discriminalization, sorry, discrimination and deprivation of sexual citizenship. To be fair, it is not normal for American queers to study American society. However, the banality of queer colonialism and queer coloniality operates when American scholars conduct and gatekeep knowledge production without awareness that their own privileged English writing and provincial tastes may project it imperial, sorry, imperial power beyond the borders and conscious control. The American-centric radical queer temporality has reproduced what uh, Fabian would call the denial of coevalness. By denying feeding concurrently with Asian and Southern subalterns, queer radicals in the US established a temporal boundary between their own grievable inequalities and the ungrievable traumas of those Asian and Southern queers who failed to live in their own after era. This temporal boundary is key that turns queer radicalism to be colonial. The fourth colonial effect I found is double standards. A new set of double standards of sexual modernity is now produced. In the 17th and 19th century, homoeroticism has been prevalent in East Asia. Christian colonizers came and condemned it as a moral corruption and under civilization as many um, wonderful uh, books in the plenary scholarship in the field has been showing here now in the 21st century when many european american countries have legalized since marriage the asians that had not followed their own lead are again being framed as conservative and under civilized. The double standards of sexual modernity operate as a colonial trap and an imperial trope to repeatedly backward Asian sexualities. So producing the four colonial effects a queer theory like homonormativity colludes with American imperialism 
and Christian supremacy to continuously do dominate the Oriental others. So um, I concluded the article with um, a call um, for um, the global queer scholarship to move toward a decolonial queer theory. So how can we decolonize queer theory? Provisualizing and transnationalizing queer civilization with proper geographic and temporal self reservations would be an important step. Queer theory should go beyond a quote unquote a particular brand of US area studies, as uh, Debbie Ann and Jessica Pawar suggested in their own recent article. Queer theory must come with Asianizing, Africanizing, Latinizing, and Southernizing the common sense of queer canons, creating South South dialogues to decentralize imperial epistemology. Scholars should question Orientalist representations of Asian queers in media and even scholarly work who are producing colonial harm. Thinking concurrently and transnationally with global queer comrades will help reconceptualize the American temporality in relation to various queer time zones at the same time. In this fan, uh, queer theory could be reimagined as a grounded, radical, and decolonial project that is truly fluid, flexible, and intertwined with hundreds of queer timelines flowing in multiple directions toward multi-dimensional queer futures. So um, this is what I made um, in the conclusion of this article. Uh, and so you can see I use Taiwan as and uh, what a sociologist Michael Birway would call ex extended case method to challenge decolonize um, the epistemology and temporality in queer theory um, tradition. But in this talk, no, I want to, uh, I added another new slide just for this talk um, because I want to put this uh, research in conversation with many uh, pioneering uh, minds you know, in the Taiwanese study area. So I would say, you know, what I found and presented in this article um, also uh, produced some implications to both the queer scholars and the Taiwanese study scholars. So I think you no, know, um, our research approach is to be both querying Taiwan studies and decolonizing queer worldviews. Uh, let me give you three um, three points. One is you no, know, um, when a doctor um, fell said you no, know, the queer scholarships have been a long term um, that feels within the Taiwanese studies. Um, Yet I feel you know, in the social scientific studies, the queer subjectivities and queerness has been uh, long term marginalized, hidden or even silenced. So the future of Taiwanese studies you know, can um, be more fruitful if we can uh, work together to reveal more queer subjectivities in all major Taiwanese historical stages and the key moments and in all kinds of substantive sub areas. So for example, queers are not just someone with you no know, different sexual orientations or different gender identities. Queer subjectivities and queer queerness has been existing even before the term queer has been uh, in, incorporated into academic uh, lexicon. So in queer in Taiwan studies, you no, know, we can use the queer theory to reimagine and to reveal the queerness in the stages of Qing Dynasty in Japanese colonialism um, to the modern social movements like Wild Lady Movement, Wild Strawberry Movement, Sunflower Movement, um, and beyond. So uh, I borrowed the cover you know, from the book uh, Dr. Shelley Riggers, Why Taiwan Matter, and argue that actually you know, we can think more deeply about why Taiwan queerness matters. And um, I'm very appreciate um, about you know, Dr. Shelley Rigger's book because you know, in this uh, book published in 2003, actually Dr. Rigger ended her uh, historical development um, 
and uh, with the milestone of the first ever gay pride parade, LGBT pride parade in Taiwan as uh, one of the milestones, but also the beginning of the Taiwan's uh, democratization. Um, so uh, many people in Taiwan, including myself, argue you now the Taiwan studies uh, should not only focus on the democratization and the consequences of that um, in Taiwan, but also the democratization of intimacy um, that is beyond the traditional political economic domains and to think about how the culture, intimate, sexual, gender relationships has been democratized you know, in the Taiwanese areas and the studies. Second, you no, know, I also want to talk to um, the queer, gender, and sexuality studies um, that we need to work together to decolonize the Euro-American centric queer feelings and the worldviews. Um, I really appreciate that I had a chance to talk to uh, many um, brilliant scholars in the UK today, because, you know, as I just told you a few slides ago, you know, Taiwan legalized um, LGBTQ inclusive education as early as 2004. 2004, you know, which is part of the legalization of Gender Equity Education Act. But we can also find that you know, around 2019 to 2021, um, this uh, official in Scotland argued that Scotland would be the first country in the world to add LGBTQ history to all school curricula. Well, um, if Taiwan is a person, Taiwan may say to Scotland, like um, my body, my people, um, welcome to join the club. Um, well, we are so glad that you can join the club of um, the National Tongzhi LGBTQ Education, um, but you are not the first. Um, so please look at and uh, recognize the existence of Taiwan's contribution. So finally, I will say, you no, know, Taiwan is queer and queer is Taiwan. Now, when many Taiwan studies you know, has been talking about the marginalization, um, the ignorance about Taiwan in the world, you no, know, actually queer folks you know, around the country uh, and around the world has been suffering from the same isolation, stigmatization, marginalization, um, to name a few. So Taiwan studies, scholars, and Taiwanese people can learn a lot from the queer theories and queer critics toward uh, these multidimensional discriminations. Conversely, queer is Taiwan, where many queer folks um, has been struggling with identities, um, with uh, invis invisibility and silence. No, Taiwan studies had a long genealogy and tradition to visualize how a nation um, has been suffering from the same cases and international and global stages. And queer folks can also learn from Taiwan in terms of the importance of identity, um, not only the anti-identitarianism, uh, but how important the identity, the uh, social solidarity, um, and the different thinking about the left-right political spectrum uh, could be useful to re-transform the queer thinking, feeling, and the worldview. All right, so those are the three bullets that I want to share with my uh, dear colleagues in Europe. And finally, I want to conclude by uh, <laughs> recycling and, and reciting this important slogan. Uh, La revolution has yet to succeed struggles remain for Tongzhi comrades in solidarity. Thank you so much for the listening and I welcome uh, all kinds of questions, suggestions, uh, because that will be part of my future book that I'm currently writing so diligently. So I really love to uh, learn from many of your questions, suggestions and comments. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, fantastic. Uh, that was a fascinating uh, talk, which covered so many different um, uh, angles. I mean, I was really excited to, to hear that you've got the, um, uh, you're working on, on the book project, because one of the things that struck me from your article was um, how much work was involved in terms of the, the field work, the number of interviews, and the length of your interviews um, was, 
Um, so one of my first questions that I was thinking about was, how did you actually manage to do that kind of integration between um, very a very kind of theoretical approach, but also such rich um, um, kind of fieldwork um, uh, data? So that was the kind of the first thing I was thinking about. Um, and um, okay, let me just kind of leave myself to maybe one more question. That was about I thought it was really interesting when you talked about querying Taiwan studies towards the end of your uh, of your presentation. I mean, I would agree with you that um, the topic I think was quite marginal in Taiwan studies. Let's say uh, uh, ten years ago, the word it was the you really had to search. Um, but my sense is that the topic has become a lot more. Um, uh, covered in a lot more diversely in the last uh, decade or so. But maybe one of the things that's missing is something that kind of brings uh, the whole field together. Uh, a kind of, I mean, in a way, that was the kind of thing that I was trying to do with the Contemporary Taiwan Indigenous um, uh, book, to kind of look at that topic from different disciplinary angles. Um, something that could be used almost like a as a, as a textbook. So I, I would be... Um, um, I'd be curious about um, your thoughts on maybe how that could be uh, done. Um, and in other words, because you clearly still feel that there's a little bit of marginalization in the Taiwan studies field. So did you have a kind of a, um, uh, a solution, something to kind of broaden the, um, uh, the kind of um, the appeal? So just two, that's my two starting questions, and I'll probably come back with more later. All right. Thank you, Dr. Phil, uh, for the two insightful questions. Um, each of them may desire an, another article to finish uh, answering them in full, but let me try to finish that in two seconds, I mean two minutes. One is you know, how to merge the theory and methods. Um, I need to admit that this article was not coming from you know, a small scale thinking and um, like you know, a small grant. Actually, you know, the idea has been lingering in my mind for um, more than a decade. Uh, let me answer your question, not from a trickle-down knowledge production perspective, but from, from a button-up perspective by sharing you a small story, if I may. Um, in the 20th anniversary conference of you know, one of the largest Taiwan queer Gender Sexuality Studies Center in the Central um, National Central University, uh, Zhuang Daxue, held by Josephine Hall and many of her wonderful colleagues. This a scene took place like this. Um, Dr. Hans Huang, you know, who used the queer theory and the critical sexuality studies you know, to study the HIV AIDS policies, uh, has been challenged um, many HIV AIDS activists on the ground you know, as you know, uh, one of the bodies of the extension of governmentality, you know, the expansion of Taiwanese government you know, to use those NGOs you know, um, to control Taiwanese uh, people's body by uh, you know, um, taking the blood test, you know, by monitoring, monitoring people's health, etc. That's a very clear uh, example about using the Foucauldian critics analysis and to impose that upon the Taiwanese NGOs activities. After that presentation, you know, there are two uh, NGO HIV AIDS activists spoke up and to say, actually, you know, our thinking and our decision making was not as straightforward, as not simplistic as your research represented. You no, know, we take some governmental money strategically um, and use that in a very queer and sexualized way. So if uh, folks are interested in this uh, domain, you, know, you can Google like uh, song Y Y, like a song, the singer song, and Y Y as a letter. And in the Taiwanese language, it's so strong Y Y, which means like sexual pleasure. Uh, so that's the way that use the governmental money in a very queer, radical, and, and funny way as well. And they also said that we don't take some money that only you know. Um, uh, allow government you know, to use our bodies to monitor Taiwanese people at all. And the scholar you know, Dr. Huang said back to the criticisms that he received you know, from the audience, saying, oh, you should write it down. Otherwise, I have no story to study. 
that was only one of the few, uh, one of the many examples that has been observing in the LGBTQ adolescence in, in, um, uh, in terms of the tensions between queer scholarship and the queer adolescent. And I was part of the queer activism uh, as well because you no, know, I organized many pre uh, press conferences. You no, know, and I also I my body was also in the first ever um, legislation against uh, 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 public hearing held by Xiao Meiqing uh, uh, in back in 2006. You no, know, that's the first ever Taiwan's Congress Congress had a public hearing about same sex marriage in 2006. Um, so I can see both world. Um, then, you know, by writing this article, I need to go back to read all the genealogy of queer criticism about since marriage and to understand you know, how can I put my uh, grown up you know, imperial data collected from Taiwan in the conversation with the American queer genealogy. Yeah, both work. So you know, the constant travel between your uh, field, you know, to put your own hands dirty and your own studio to put your your mind uh, fussy. So I hope that answered your first question. Uh, the second question is about, you know, um, how to queer uh, Taiwan studies. Well, this is a, a, a kind of invitation. Well, maybe some um, like strong minds in the queer studies should start to read some cutting edge queer theories and studies as the first step. Then your mind will be queered or unqueered or dequeered or semi-queered to some extent way. Um, so, and I try to use my body, my back as the bridge, you know, to to bridge you know, the two fields, um, but I welcome more people to join uh, the bridge camp. Okay, let's open up now then to um, audience members. So the floor is yours. Please, if you'd like to raise a question, just um, uh, raise your hand um, and then uh, you should be able to open your, your mics. Um, okay, yeah, Chung Yu, would you like to go first? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Professor Gao. It's a, such an exciting and fascinating talk. And I was just, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited in uh, talking, uh, like listening to your uh, research. So my question is more or less on um, the methodological level. So as you said that you spent like 22 months on site, but also like online ethnographic research. So my question, my first question is like, how do you regard this online or cyber cyberspace kind of ethnographic site? And how would you like in, in your research, like how uh, you like connect or or, you know, inter like wandering in between on site um, ethnographic site and the digital site? Um, do you think that uh, like and also like what kind of uh, ethnographic data you are focusing on when you are uh, like researching it? Is it the narrative you are focusing on or their practices? Uh, is that like the movement, the strategies or everyday resistance you are you are uh, you are focusing on? Like what kind of data are you are focusing on? Yeah, uh, maybe just one question first. Thank you. All right, yeah, one by one. That's yeah, do the role. Um, so to answer your question about how to uh, shift between online ethnography and on-site ethnography, that's a wonderful question, and I hope um, in my appendix of my book can elaborate that point further because you know um, the methodology issue is quite complex in my own field, right? I have I told you that I have uh, so many different hats. Uh, and also using multi-site as well. Uh, you know, in my article, I really had a very limited space to explain my methodology because you know, <laughs> the first draft of this article was like 15,000 words, and sexualities also give you 7,000 words to elaborate. <laughs> so yeah. Um, um, well, I, I can report from a more like uh, in, uh, empirical way. Uh, I. 
My first longer stage about the field work you know, took place between 2015 and 2016, you know, which is the, first, uh, the second peak of uh, the Taiwan's cultural war, which means you know, the debate between poor and anti LGBTQ uh, human rights, right? If people remember, you now uh, uh, 2015 you know, is the moment when Taiwan witnessed the first ever Christian based party. Uh, um, the Faith and Hope League, and some people in my field marked it as the, like a no love league. Uh, so that's the first pick. Uh, I spent almost a year uh, in my field you know, to study the publications of the Christian conservative uh, journals and magazines, and I accumulate questions you know, toward the, the later stage of my ethnography to really call out to those uh, people to see if they want to be interviewed by me. Um, and that was the first part. But you know, our study uh, is always uh, following the evolution of Taiwanese case, right? So around uh, 2017, you know, the Supreme Court uh, announced the ruling you know, in favor of census couples, right? So called uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court interpre interpretation number 748. Uh, followed by another huge backlash of the conservative pushback by using the newly formed refer um, the referendum uh, law, right? And uh, we witnessed the, the devastating uh, pushback and you know, voting against census marriage you know, in late 2018. Uh, then in the 20, 2019, uh, we had a successful legalization of sex marriage by uh, the cooperation between uh, the legislation yuan and the administrative yuan, uh, executive yuan. Um, so now my own field need to follow all kind of picks to be able to document you know, all kind of data, if I may. So during the summers and the winters, if I had a chance, you know, I will travel back to Taiwan and do accumulate more the follow up interviews. Uh, but when my body uh, is limited you know, to serve as the TA chef, you know, when I was you know, still a uh, Rutgers uh, PhD sociology student, you know, I need to TA uh, or to write up my dissertation or find a job. Or now I'm teaching as assistant professor at VCU in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, so I will use the online ethnography to collect more data. And you don't know what? And sometimes, you no, know, um, in the traditional mind, you no, know, some people may look down the online ethnography, but I found sometimes it's not true to my own research in the way that you no know, more people pretend or they they you no know, conservatism is very performative. So they try to occupy the, uh, the rhetoric and discourses domains online, you know, the hegemony, uh, hegemony of discourse. So they are very uh, talkative and they want to be heard. Uh, and so sometimes the own public discourses are very rich um, to some extent. But, um, but that is not to say that the online ethnography by studying the discourses can be uh, substitute to the on-site ethnography, no. So sometimes the interviews um, um, are performative as well. They try to play that kind of nice guy figures, you know, to be as liberal, as open-minded, as uh, decent as well. But sometimes ethnography, you know, if they did not know there's a critical mind existing in the field, you know, for example, in the church, uh, in the own public uh, rallies, they imagine they are talking to their people. Uh, and so their own language will be very straightforward, more spiritual and religious, and um, more Euro, um, well authoritarian or dictatorship in the spiritual and, and the political way as well. So that's why. No, I would say I would um, self frame myself as the, um, the mixed research method scholar. Uh, so no uh, methodology can replace each other. So we need to put those data together. But you are right. No, when the data are overwhelming, <laughs> the writing part is also not that easy. No, it is not like you run a regression model report. You report how many starts and the significance, right? And you test the models. Uh, that well, statistical work is equally important. Uh, but no, the 
muddy um, and the messy collective data has its own challenge to figure out the social patterns and to uh, and to find a story to tell. Did I answer your question? Yeah, like I, I have a very, uh, like follow up if I may, uh, because um, I was like uh, use also using this hy quite hybrid like digital ethnographic method, uh, both in my BA dissertation and currently in my MA dissertation. So sometimes I just feel like for a ethnographer that when you are doing digital like ethnographic interview it is very kind of hard for me to like really situate or doing this quite immersive like observation on my uh, intellectuals especially when i trying to write something like some tales upon these uh, interviewees i found i'm quite an armchair anthropologist sometimes you know i i'm not sure if you are facing the same like problem when you are writing your tales or your ethnographies um do you have any like solutions on that or yeah oh my dear uh, you will be a wonderful ethnographer and you have been a wonderful ethnographer just by saying so. Uh, and I can tell you uh, <laughs> that is a lingering and chronic anxiety that you always would have as a wonderful, outstanding ethnographer. Because no, in the field, no, uh, well, um, in your studio or your own cupid in your own office, you will feel uh, anxious uh, just uh, not putting your body in the field that you uh, imagine you can observe the first-hand uh, data, which is partially true. Um, so, yeah, with that said, you no, know, if you immerse yourself too long in the field, you no, know, sometimes you no, know, it's you'll be a bit amazed by the complexity and the fluidity of the ethnographic data. Yet that is also important. You no. Know, as a researcher, uh, you are not a journalist. You are not only a storyteller. You are not only you know, one of the people that you study, right? You need to put into a conversation between the empirical data and the theories and you know, the genealogy of the scholarship that you try to contribute to. So um, I also found myself, you know, when I immersed myself too long in the field, I lost track of reading the most cutting edge books and the journal articles. And so I need to like um, extract myself from the deep mud in the field work and put myself into my studio with hundreds of books <laughs> to study another field of knowledge. And I think that's uh, one of our challenges, but also um, the um, the, the pleasure as well, you no, know, by shifting between the studio and the field. I just had a follow up question to 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 tell you about um, about my, my sense is that often sociologists to work on sociologists in Taiwan often find it hard to work on conservative groups. Uh, in other words, um, um, my sense is that often they find it hard to gain trust of interviewees. Um, um, and I was wondering, was that a problem uh, for you as, as someone who's kind of uh, openly LGBT to uh, to gain the trust of someone whose um, project is basically against you? <laughs> That's a very reasonable and uh, a wonderful question, Dr. Fell. And you are totally right. I need to explain that you know, in the appendix of my book. And I had. Uh, let, me, let, let me share re with you a bit. Um, well, first of all, I want to start with a question to all the brilliant minds here. Do we have enough studies about Asian conservatism? Right? Th that fundamental question is a problem per se. Now, I have one small cube on my bookshelf that documents, for example, Japanese colonialism or Chinese colonialism, sorry, uh, Japanese and Chinese conservatism. Well, but the articles are very few. Um, I think uh, very it's very problematic in many ways. One is you no know, Asianists tend to be conservatized you know, in the Western mind, right? So Asian tradition, Confucianism, blah blah blah. 
And two, um, the European or American minds tend to impose their own uh, left and right political spectrum to consider East Asia. For example, when Taiwanese nationalism, you no know, fight for independence, you no know, fight for the uh, self governor governance and sovereignty, you no know, was considered conservative in American left wing minds because they think nationalism is always bad, you no, know, and they think that kind of nationalism from the you know the far right or Trumpist. Uh, perspective, they cannot imagine why Taiwan as a country want to establish itself, you know, based on the Taiwanese nationalism. So that's why, you know, that's why I conclude with the speech only one, with one sentence saying that, you know, um, many Taiwanese scholarships can contribute to reshape the American thinking of left-right political spectrum. You no, know, that this is really the spin their own uh, minds and you no know, to put their own worldview upside down. And they cannot imagine why communism or socialism could be conservative. Yeah, I will just put the words there. We can have more another hour discussion about this part. And um, to answer your question about methodology, no, you are right that sometimes, you no, know, because of my uh, openness, uh, of my queerness and the queer activism participation, I was rejected by some conservative groups. One funny story I tend to share is like I go to uh, a conservative church based group though, who tend to train thousands of parents, including conservative moms um, to disguise themselves as teachers, you know, rainbow moms, and they want to tell the story to the children in the morning time. Um, but under the table, actually, they are uh, evangelizing those kids you know, in the elementary or junior high schools and to recruit them into the church. Well, there's a larger genealogy about the neoliberalization of the Christianity around the world. Uh, no, um, well, <laughs> I saved thousands of words about that. Uh, but um, when I was rejected, also some doors were open just because of my openness. So for example, there's an underground uh, Christian close uh, focus group, closed door focus group. Uh, the leader of that group invited me actively to join the Christian only group because you no, know, he tried to establish a platform uh, for Christians in different political stance to be able to talk to each other in a relatively safer um, sphere. And he found that the group was too moderate. People tend to be polite and to hide their own real thinking. So they need a stimulus like me to uh, stimulate their own conversation. Um, and uh, as you, I said, you know, some conservatives are not that protective um, of themselves. They are very focal and they are, I don't want to say they are attention seeker, but they need attention. Uh, so, no, they, they are very vocal in the way to spread their own words um, and words. So, um, so that's how I can study part of them. But I also witnessed, you know, the study and data collection is not perfect. Um, then a feminist positionality and epistemology taught us no research is 100% uh, objective and neutral. And so that's why I have one slide to tell you my positionality and uh, allowed my audience and readerships to evaluate, you know, um, the contribution and the biases of the, you know, my knowledge production. Uh, fantastic. OK, so would anyone else like to kind of um, chip in with uh, questions or, or comments? We still have um, a good 20 minutes or so. Um, if you're OK, yeah, Leon, go ahead. Hi, yeah, can you hear me OK? Um, I thought it was a super fascinating talk, so thank you for that. And um, yeah, I learned a lot, and that's a lot of food for thought that I will have to digest. I think it was quite uh, dense in a way. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about sort of comparison to the PRC, because I would imagine that that's quite a common comparison in the sort of conventional discourse, sort of pitting Taiwan and its progress on the linear path towards sort of queer modernization 
with China and its perceived backwardness in the path and also other authoritarian states like Russia and so on, where I, I guess queer people and bodies and subjectivities have been become sort of part of that struggle in a sense between democracy and authoritarianism, often um, with very bad consequences for these communities. And um, I was hoping that it's possible to sort of complicate that a little bit. Um, but yeah, would be really interested in hearing your thoughts. I've not really thought about it enough, to be honest, but so it'd be great to hear what you think. Thank you. Thank you, Leon, for the thought-provoking question. Um, I, I think someone should write a paper about that. Um, and let me give you only two layers of thought uh, by addressing both the similarity and the differences. Um, the similarity part is, you no. Know, well, some people can study the shared identity, like Tongzhi, across the street. Um, recently, um, one of the pioneering sexuality scholars in my field, uh, Travis Kong, you know, who is also one of the co-editor you know, in the journal Sexualities, published two articles. You know, one is the long uh, ethnographic, sorry, uh, encyclopedia entry, and the other is the journal article, you no, know, I believe in Journal of Homosexuality, talking about you know, the trans transnational trajectory of the idea, Tongzhi. Right, and we know Tongzhi directs from the communist uh, origin, you know, in the comrades, right, and um, the Hong Kong uh, film festival makers like Lin Yihua or Mike, you know, has been sexualized and queered the term Tongzhi to call name um, the gays and lesbian uh, and 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 more sexual and gender minorities in the in the group. So that is a sexualization of a traditional orthodoxy political term. But the term did not win enough um, readership and the popularity until the term traveled from Hong Kong in late 1950s, sorry, 1980s to early 90s in Taiwan in the 1992 Jingma, the Golden uh, Host Award, you know, in which they have a Tongzhi Yingzhang, a Tongzhi Film Festival. Um, so the Tongzhi as a term, as an umbrella term and collective identity uh, to call LGBTQQIAA and plus um, sexual identities uh, has been winning the largest population first in Taiwan in terms of the Taiwanese uh, Tongzhi literature, right? Like Ji Da Wei's Tongzhi Taiwan, uh, Tongzhi Wen Taiwan the farming, the the history of Tongzhi literature, you know, the invention, innovation of in Taiwan, in media, in pop culture, uh, in queer activism as as well. Um, in the recent queer Asia studies, you no know, uh, scholars argue Tongzhi as the term may be the only and the most powerful alternative identity that could challenge the American-centric queer. And the term has been traveled back from Taiwan and Hong Kong to the mainland, right? So you can see like a Beijing Tongzhi Zhongxin, like a Beijing's uh, LGBTQ center, you know, which received the fund from the Western in terms of the HIV AIDS prevention programs, um, and uh, along with other film festivals as well. So that's the similarity part. So, um, and in Charles Kong's article, they discuss um, um, the similarity in terms of the Christianity, uh, sorry, Confucianism, the traditional traditions, uh, uh, Chinese history, etc. But we also witness the divergence of the LGBT development across the street in Taiwan and China. Now, when when Taiwan uh, step on the path to marriage equality and LGBTQ citizenship in general. Now, at the beginning of last decade, around 2012, now the PRC government, actually um, the central government, pretended to be open-minded and liberal. A, a prominent case would be Li Keqiang, now, you know, the second secondary powerful figure uh, had a closed door meeting with the Chinese LGBTQ activist to show that kind of openness. But whenever President Xi you know, tried to 
expand his own power and to go to toward the, the end of authoritarianism and you know, the expansion of digital surveillance and uh, also, um, the dictatorship. The past was totally uh, you know, 150, 180 degree reversed. So you, know, you may have the chance to heard some examples like um, the term, many sexual minority terms, like even Tong Xing Lian, um, the term was banned in many digital platforms in China, like in Weibo or in WeChat. Um, usually the un universities and colleges in China enjoyed a larger space for the freedom of speech and assembly. That was not the case anymore in recent two years. Um, so more than two dozens of the LGBTQ student groups and their own uh, like a public accounts Weixin Gong Zhong Hao were also recently banned uh, by China. Um, I believe recently there's another news total um, toward the negative end as well. So uh, I think one there are many factors may explain why the the two countries you know has been going on in the divergent way. And I believe one of the keys would be nationalism. No, uh, it I, to me it is not an incident. It is not surprising to see the year 2019 we witness the legalization of sex marriage in Taiwan, along with the rise of uh, anti-China solidarity, um, the anxiety about Hong Kong's protest, and so-called um, um, the national sensibility of losing Taiwan as a country. So no, it is not surprising to see no many politicians using the case Taiwan's legalization of marriage as the way to rebuild Taiwan as the um, liberal beacon for Asians and for Asian gays. Because after more than three decades of you know, Taiwan was framed as the democratic beacon, uh, as the window, as the window model for the Western democracies, you no know, marriage equality becomes a new uh, brand um, to follow that that trend. Uh, while the Chinese nationalism was at stake. Um, so to ban um, and to suppress many LGBTQ rights, along with many other political, sexual, uh, colonial, uh, decolonial incidents, becomes one of the way to reconsolidate its own um, legitimacy of control and governance. Um, so that's just my two cents, and I assess that someone need to write a later uh, to, uh, uh, articles. Uh, about this very complex um, question. I hope that answers your question. Great, thanks uh, Leon for that, that question. And BU. Hello, uh, hello, thank you very much. It's really a fascinating talk. I really um, learned a lot. I have to say, also giving us some sort of inspiration, I would say, to rethink how we approach theories, right? as well as how uh, we can subvert some of this kind of Eurocentric way of thinking. So thank you very much. Um, I really, uh, really enjoy it. And it's really, full, uh, really packed with stuff, really fantastic. So I have two questions because I have to think about what my questions are. That's why I waited so long to organize my mind. So I got one, first question. Um, have you have you had, I, I would say, have you had any trouble or being criticized uh, to some degree uh, by your own use of queer theories? Okay, because that's using Western theories to challenge. Another, uh, the second question following that is that uh, what is your strategy to decolonize uh, Western theories and, and make it your own? So actually, I, I think you quite successful uh, in terms of doing your own way. But would you like to just share it with us? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang, for two wonderful questions. Um, 
first, no, let me, um, well, actually, I did not receive any troubles um, or criticisms by using queer theory in this way. Uh, maybe I think it is because I enjoy a kind of climate um, when many of my American queer theorists and uh, study uh, scholars um, shared a climate of that kind of political correctness, uh, you know, the thousand voices, you know, um, the decolonial uh, attempts tend to be more tolerated uh, within this uh, field in which they self-perform or self-portrayed as progressive, uh, far left wing, um, uh, progressive in many different ways. Um, I was a bit shocked by your use of a global south. I thought, is it applicable to Taiwan? So, sorry, carry on. No, that's a wonderful question, right? So actually, you know, in another small talk that I gave at the, um, the Taiwanese Ministry of Science and Technology, I say, um, so maybe that's, they can answer your second question. I say Taiwan is a wonderful case, not because I'm Taiwanese, I was born in Taiwan, so that's, I say so. If you think from the social scientific ways, many, many, basic and fundamental frameworks that we have been using to think about the world and our societies are not only American centric, but also they do not fit in Taiwan's case or Taiwan's case did not fit in. Let me give you a, some quick examples. No, one is no, the left and right political spectrum, right? As I said to Dr. Phil, no, nationalism is not conservative in Taiwan's case, and socialism is not that idealistic or utopian uh, at all. Taiwan had a very realistic understanding about those terms. So that one, that can challenge their own basic left and right consideration. And two, as Dr. Chang, you just said, where is Taiwan in the global north and south map? And my interviewees also had the same question. Like, um, they, uh, whenever they try to represent the global South to like the UN woman or UN centric uh, uh, conferences, they were treated as Southern because other deeper Southern LGBTQ activists did not enjoy the privilege that they can one, be coming up because they will be, you know, uh, receiving the threats of homicide, um, no, threatened, or even expelled from their own country. So Taiwan was one of the, at least Taiwan is not white, not northern, at one hand. And is Taiwan northern? Uh, economically speaking, Taiwan is strife, but Taiwan is not, no, West Europe, North America, Japan, Australia, etc. So, I encourage my LGBTQ activist friends, we do not need to squeeze Taiwan into the limitations of the global south slash north uh, diagram. Taiwan is in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And you no, know, we can use the Taiwanese case to learn and to put that into the conversation with another group of studies, which is transnational feminism and so-called borderline studies. I'm not sure if people in UK read this group. No, uh, because there's a huge borderline between the US and Mexico, right? So the borderland studies like uh, Maria Lugones, um, among with many others, you no. Know, visualize and theorize the borderland studies. And one of the uh, followers in the Taiwanese queer studies in is Fang Ting Chen, no, Zheng Fang Ting, who is an associate professor um, of, uh, I forgot, is a Taiwanese culture or the performance arts in the National Taiwan University, now created a new term called um, Taiwanese, uh, oh, well, sorry, queer island disidentification to reimagine how Taiwan uh, provides the rethinking about identity by putting itself between the margins of both Chinese modern modernity and uh, American modernity. So, you know, that's another way that Taiwanese scholars can learn from the queer theories. We do not, well, queer scholars do not love to be put at the center. They enjoy their own positionality at the margins 
and use the margin uh, the margin positionality to critique um, the complexity, the inconsistency, um, and the heterogeneity and self conflicts for those who were centered at the center. Um, so. Yeah, so it's, it's the way that Taiwan can challenge so many different spectrums, north and south, right and uh, left and right, progressive and conservative, etc. So that's why I feel Taiwan study is exciting. It is not just a way to justify that Taiwan is important. People look at the you no, know, hey, don't ignore us. Uh, it is also you no know, Taiwan uh, again using the Michael Bureau way uh, term. Taiwan is an um, the extended case method that can be used to bridge the macro level structural analysis and the macro level uh, process uh, discussions and also try to challenge the blind spot of many basic theories and use Taiwan as the extended case method to transform the, the theories for the global audience. Thank you. OK, so we, we're kind of running out of time, but I think we might have time for one more question. Would you really like to uh, give us a final question uh, for today's session? How about Professor? Uh, the, uh, I think it's. Sorry. Were you kind of thinking about uh, Professor uh, Santillan? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, I do have a question. So in your talk, oh, first of all, it's really nice to see you again. Um, I think we met at Rutgers a few years ago. So I really enjoyed this talk. And there's one detail in your talk that really intrigued me. You mentioned that uh, most of the activists who led the marriage equality movement in Taiwan were women. Uh, could you comment on that? Uh, why do you think that was the case? Hello, Dr. Sansula. I'm so glad to see you here. And your uh, pioneering book is one of my inspiration sources. So this is really my great honor to see you here. Um, Thank you. In terms of women's participation, that's a good question. And um, let me give you a funny way to answer it before I give you the theoretical thought. The funny way is if you uh, like me interviewed my um, LGBTQ activist interviewees, um, like the prominent leader, uh, Jennifer Lu, uh, Lu Xingjie, Xingjie's answer will be very short and quick because lesbians love to marry. And you know what? Um, Based on the ethnography, you know, I found actually the gay men's part had more uh, skepticism about census marriage, right? That totally challenged you know, the you know, American queer theorization, which argues that you know, marriage is always the patriarchal heteronormative institutes, right? And the, uh, the ownership of the marriage is the way to replicate you know, the patriarchal heteronormative inequality and that may replicate the male domination of women's body, which is totally not the case in Taiwan. Uh, as the numbers I sh show you, you know, uh, women are the major leaders and the major beneficiaries you know, of the marriage equality in Taiwan. Then, um, so really, uh, for example, if you calculate the two major leading organizations for marriage equality in Taiwan, including Huiying Ping Chun Da Ping Kai, the marriage equality platform, now uh, rebranded as uh, Rainbow uh, Equality Platform. And the other, Ban Lui Mong, uh, you know, um, the Alliance for the Partnership, uh, for Partnership Rights. I cannot memorize all the things. I need, always it's need to look it up. Hard. But you know the case. But two major leaders in those two major um, organizations, including Victoria Xu, you know, uh, Xu uh, Xiaowen and Lu uh, Xingjie, they both are cisgender women, um, right? And uh, many of the own workers are women in different ways, including cisgender women, um, lesbians, bisexual women, trans women as well. 
And one of the factors why gay men were not that passionate uh, about same-sex marriage is one is don't forget, you no know, Taiwan's temporality also flipped the American-centric thinking about history. Taiwan's uh, criminalization of marriage adultery was not decriminalized until since its marriage one year later. And you no, know, when many Western countries has been decriminalized um, the adultery many years ago before the marriage equality, Taiwan was not the case. So, you know, many gay men had a more um, extra re relationship, um, open relationship or polyamorous interactions. They don't want to put their own uh, bodies, self and intimacies you know, into uh, the, the prison cells of marriage or the, <laughs> no, you, you know the metaphor. Then, so uh, they have a less um, passion uh, and more skepticism about marriage as the institution. That's one. But with that said, you no, know, many gay men also enjoy more uh, power and the freedom in terms of the own mobility uh, and the financial resources. So they also become um, one of the major supporters to the marriage equality campaigns, including donating the money or put their own bodies at the uh, uh, MRT stations, the Jie Wing Zhan, no, as the Hui Ping Quan Xiao Mi Feng, um, the marriage equality campaign, bubble bees, you no, know, to distribute the flyers, you no, know, to convince people to vote against uh, the conservative referendum, etc. So I would say the gender really had a heterogeneous impact, you no, know, in the marriage equality campaign in different ways, you no, know, um, but. Um, in this article, I only highlight you know, the woman's part who uh, challenged American civilization. But I, I agree that we need a deeper analysis about the gender, gender dynamics and the gender inequality that has been both challenging but also replicated you know, in the American, uh, in the Taiwanese marriage equality campaign. That deserves another chapter in my book to describe that, but <laughs> I will save the words here. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Fantastic. Thanks a lot, and uh, thanks, Professor Sam, for that question as well. It's always good to to, uh, uh, to see you. So, because of time, we're going to have to bring things to a, uh, a close. But could I ask people to um, uh, turn on your uh, mics and give uh, Professor Gao a very big uh, SOAS round of applause? Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation. And, and thanks to uh, all of you for your fantastic uh, questions as well. Um, I should say that um, uh, we're going to be doing more at the centre uh, next week. Next week, we actually have uh, four Taiwan Studies events. Um, on Tuesday, Beatrice Zani will be doing her book launch. Um, on Wednesday, we'll, that will be an online talk. Then on Wednesday, we have two in-person events. Uh, we have Felix... Um, uh, uh, Brenda speaking about transitional justice. Uh, we have a uh, history talk by Chen Boshi from Cambridge. Uh, and then the fourth event will be uh, Joseph Wang speaking on uh, on Friday about his new book with uh, Dan Slater, which looks at um, development and democratization in uh, in East Asia. So we have a packed um, um, uh, set of events uh, next week. Uh, Biu, you want to say something? I would just want to remind uh, how you maybe we can take a group photo. So if our audience can switch on your ca uh, camera, that would be great. Yeah, I good love point. that. After John, I, you can read my mind. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Ah. Three, two, one. We do have a blank jaw. S.Y. Zhao, can you switch on your camera or turn it off? At the moment, it's blank. Ah, ah OK. <laughs> OK, thank you. Okay. Oh, it's Hong Kong or Taiwan? Three, two, one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. OK, have a great day, everyone. And uh, I'll see many of you uh, next week at our four um, events. Thank you so much.
Bye. Have a good day. Thanks. I look forward to the book. Where... <laughs> Try. Yeah, we'll have another another launch for your book. <laughs> Thank you so much.